When you reach the end of your life and you look back over your time on earth, what legacy will you leave to the next generation? Has your life reflected your faith in God's providential care? Alistair Begg asks us to consider these important questions today on Truth For Life as he continues toward the end of our study of the life of Joseph. Can I invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Genesis and to chapter 50? And we're just going to read again these concluding words of the chapter. Genesis 50 and verse 22, Joseph stayed in Egypt along with all his father's family. He lived 110 years and saw the third generation of Ephraim's children. Also the children of Machir, son of Manasseh, were placed at birth on Joseph's knees. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will surely come to your aid and take you up out of this land to the land he promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Joseph made the sons of Israel swear an oath and said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry up my bones from this place. So Joseph died at the age of 110, and after they had embalmed him, he was placed in a coffin in Egypt. Let's just pause in prayer. Oh God, you authored this book, and you have sent your Spirit to be the interpreter of the book as we seek to study it. And so we pray that your Spirit will be our teacher, so that whether we speak or speak and listen, or just listen, that we might hear your voice, and that the challenge of the life of Joseph may not simply have an impact for tonight, but may actually live with us through all our days. For we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. I've never been involved in uh, any kind of drama. I suppose if I'd like to be in anything, it would probably be some Shakespearean drama, maybe one of the gravediggers in Hamlet. Nothing very elaborate, certainly not Hamlet, certainly no great part, but I wouldn't mind trying one of the gravedigger's parts, or I wouldn't mind Polonius either in Hamlet. I think I'm uh, verbose enough to be Polonius. But uh, I've often wondered what it must be like to play a part like that, and night after night after night in a prolonged run, and then finally, on the last evening, take off the costume and uh, bid the part farewell and return to the normal course of events. I'm sure there is a sense of attachment that goes beyond merely the playing of the part. And if there is any approximation to that in the teaching of Scripture, it probably comes most forcibly when one is engaged over a prolonged period of time in a character study such as we've been with Joseph. And I hope that at least for a few of you, you will share with me the sense of sadness that is part of this. And I don't mean it in any sort of nostalgic way, but a genuine sense of sadness in having, as it were, to close the book, close the chapter on the life of Joseph. And actually, although he has died, yet he has still lived and spoken to us through his life. And for many of us, our lives will never be the same again as a result of these studies in the life of this ancient patriarch. And we have tried, as best we've been enabled, to make application of the truth of God's Word all the way along the line. And tonight, I want to make these three simple and straightforward further points of application. Clearly, we are forced to acknowledge the frailty of our own lives on any occasion when we are confronted with the biblical record of death. And that is the first straightforward point of application, namely the frailty that we acknowledge. It's not my purpose to go back and rehearse the points that we have made in consideration of the death of Jacob over these last few weeks. But it is simply to be reminded and to remind one another of the fact that each of us, as we have said before, has a shelf life. And in the same way as we find pieces of produce in our grocery stores marked by a date, which is the su suggested date to be used by, so in the economy of God and in the purpose of God, each of our lives are marked in that way. God has not chosen to give to us the date of our demise, 
But the psalmist tells us that every day of our lives was written in his book before one of them came to be. And he has given some indication of the longevity of life by addressing the issue of what it would mean to live for 70 years. And some of us tonight, by dint of a careful reading of the Scripture and also an ability simply to observe the passing of time, realize that we are beyond our use-by date. And others of us feel ourselves to be very far away from the use-by date, of course never knowing what a day will bring forth. Now tonight, without being morbid in any way, the Bible here in the record of Joseph's death, as with others uh, recorded for us in the book of Genesis, is there so that we would think about death. Uh, The Bible has a great deal to say about death and about dying. The, the, The prophet Isaiah, in the most glorious of passages, in Isaiah chapter 40, as he speaks of the wonder of the creation of God and of the dramatic power of God, both in his calling the existence of creation into being, says in verse 6 of Isaiah 40, a voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall but the word of our God stands forever. When the writer of Ecclesiastes, be it Solomon or or someone else, reaches the conclusion of the matter, as he puts it in the 12th chapter of Ecclesiastes, he has this comic, tragic picture of humanity nearing the end of its days, somewhat sightless and somewhat toothless, and struggling along the road with the stiffened gait of a grasshopper that was suffering from arthritis. And in the course of it all, the writer of the Word says, Then man goes to his eternal home, and mourners go about the streets. Remember him, that is God your Creator, before the silver cord is severed or the golden bowl is broken. A picture there of death. Another picture before the pitcher is shattered at the spring. Our lives are as fragile as pottery. Or the wheel broken at the well, the familiar turning of the wheel at the well suddenly gives out one day. So says the writer, will our lives give out one day. And the dust returns to the ground it came from, and the Spirit returns to God who gave it. And so as we stand, as it were, and gaze at the realistic way in which Joseph approaches death, as we listen to the word of the prophet reminding us of the very ephemeral nature of each of our lives, as we have this graphic picture in the poetic books of the ending of our days and of the reality of it all, it is there in order that we would do what is not customary to do, acknowledge our human frailty. We sing very little about those facts— And we sing very little about the fact of death and dying. Nobody is writing hymns about these things. It's not particularly appealing. And it is a great lack, you see, in much of our hymnody. When, for example, as just a very young man in his 20s, Murray McShane thought about these things, he penned these amazing words sometime in the early 19th century because his life was over by 1843, And he wrote like this, When this passing world is done, when has sunk yon radiant sun, when I stand with Christ on high, looking o'er life's history, then, Lord, shall I fully know, not till then, how much I owe. When the praise of heaven I hear, loud as thunder to the ear, loud as many waters noise, sweet as harps melodious voice, then, Lord, shall I fully know, not till then, how much I owe. Chosen not for good in me, wakened up from wrath to flee, hidden in the Savior's side, by the Spirit sanctified. Teach me, Lord, on earth to show, by my love, how much I owe. And one of the 
divine mechanisms in all of Holy Scripture to call the people of God to a due estimate of who we are and to a humble recognition of all that has been provided for us is the record in Scripture of the death of those who die in the Lord. Blessed are those, says the Bible, who die in the Lord. All of us tonight will one day die. That is not in question. Unless, of course, Christ should come in our lifetime. And the question is, will we die in the Lord or not? That's the first straightforward and simple point, the frailty that we are caused to acknowledge. Secondly, the theology that we are called to embrace. I hope, at least in the course of these studies, uh, you have had reinforced for you, as I have had for me, the fact that biblical doctrine is crucial, that an understanding of who God is and who we are in relationship to God that a view of the world that is framed by his divine character and purpose is absolutely essential, not only for human sanity, but in order that we might prepare to live correctly and to die properly. And the theology that we embrace is the theology which has been emblazoned for us in the life of Joseph and has been aptly summarized here in this simple little phrase, God will surely come to your aid. You will remember that we said that the story of Joseph is the story of God's providence. And when we introduced the whole issue of providence, we said that the doctrine of providence was grounded in the first book of the Bible and had its name essentially given to it in a phrase in Genesis chapter 22. And you may want to return there just for a moment to remind yourself of this so that when people say to you, well, where do you get this doctrine of providence? You can take them to this instance. In Genesis 22, as Abram takes the son for whom he had waited all these years, and as he takes in verse 6 the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and as he himself carried the fire and the knife, and as the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. And as we said this morning, the great truths of Scripture run all the way down through the corridors of the Old and the New Testament, intersecting that which we see in the opening books of the Bible right through to the very end of Scripture. Because at the very final verses of Scripture, you have this promise of the coming of God to us in the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And here in the words of Joseph, you have the promise given to these people that God will surely come to their aid, as we saw this morning. And when Paul writes in his great theological treatise to the Roman Christians in Romans chapter 5, it is this essential truth which undergirds so much of what he says. In Romans chapter 5, he says in verse 6, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. At just the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. And the story of Joseph, the theology which runs through the book of Genesis as it is revealed in the life of Joseph, is, as we've said, the great and classic expression of Romans 8, 28. And we then know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Some of us started our studies in Joseph with a spring in our step, believing that God was in his heaven and all was right with the world. And we end the studies in Joseph, having come through hell en route, being confronted with the question, do I really and truly believe that? Some of us began, and the thought of losing a loved one was something that other people experienced, but we had never known. And tonight we sit in the awareness of that. 
Some of us had only joy and anticipation filling our hearts when we opened the book of Genesis and turned to this 17-year-old boy, and we knew Romans 8:28. We'd had it on a little card. We carried it in our purse, and we used to say it to people, and we often said it glibly to people. We said it in grocery stores, and we said it at the drop of a hat. Oh, well, all things work together for good to those who love God, who are called according to His purpose. It has a kind of Scandinavian ring to it, even in the way that it comes out, a sort of a we just trot the thing out. And oh, we were so smart, but we're not so smart tonight. Because along the journey, we've had our hearts broken. We've had our faith tested. We've had our insights taken out and re-examined in our homes and in our schools and in our marriages and in our parenting and in our teenage years and in our businesses. And God has been saying to us, do you really believe this theology? Do you believe this? Are you able to say with uh, Paul later in his life, I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have entrusted to him against that day. I know of a surety No matter what I've been through, no matter how I have been distressed, no matter how my heart has been broken, still I have learned through the journey with Joseph to affirm again, God is God, and my trust and my hope is in Him. Samuel Rutherford, in the writing of his memoirs, provided for a lady by the name of Cousins, who was the wife of one of Rutherford's ministerial colleagues, the opportunity to write a most glorious hymn along the lines of the theme of providence, a hymn again that we sing sparingly. I should stop saying this. It sounds like a judgment on the hymns we're singing. It's not. It should be seen as an encouragement of the hymns we're about to sing uh, when we finally stop talking about it and start doing it. But in the hymn, The Sands of Time Are Sinking, you have this tremendous third verse— with mercy and with judgment, my web of time he wove. And I, the dews of sorrow, were lustered by his love. I'll bless the hand that guided, and I'll bless the heart that planned, when throned where glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. Or in a more contemporary song, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One look at his dear face, all sorrow will erase. So bravely run the race till you see Christ. You see, it is not a feeling in our tummies which sustains us on the journey of faith. It is a theology. It is what we know of God, that when the difficult day comes, when we find, as it were, the bone in the fish that we thought was so beautifully prepared, it is in that moment in the finding of the bone, as it were, in the experience of life, that we must then revert very clearly to what we know of God. As Jeff and I flew in from Los Angeles on Wednesday evening, we were sitting in two separate rows. I was sitting one space away from a lady from Vietnam, as it turns out. If you recall, Friday evening around uh, supper time, 5, 5.30, it was particularly cloudy. In fact, over the airport, it was downright foggy. And although we had flown in tranquility for most of the journey, as soon as we began to make our descent into the Cleveland area, uh, life took on uh, just that whole different kind of feel. And uh, the pilot told us that we would be on the ground in 10 minutes, and 10 minutes came and went, and 15 minutes came and went, and it went to 17 minutes. And the little lady sitting beside me just kept saying one thing, I can't see ground. I can't see ground which was not blessing me in any way at all. (laughs) And eventually I said to her, you ought not to be concerned that you can't see the ground. 
we ought only to be concerned that the pilot can see his instruments. For our feelings in those moments had to be brought under the jurisdiction of another, and indeed our lives were, humanly speaking, entrusted to his care. And we did see the ground seconds before we landed on the ground. And she had then to go to Baltimore, and I was done. (laughs) So she had to live it all over again. And I just had to make it safely home. The hymn writer says, as I've told you before, I thank you, Lord, that all my joys are touched with pain, that shadows fall on the brightest hours and thorns remain, so that earth's bliss may be my guide and not my chain. And if I have learned one thing in the course of of my studies in Joseph, it is this amazing truth that God, who fashioned us in our mother's womb, Psalm 139, who intricately wove us according to his divine purpose, has ordered all of our days and all of our steps. And our theology is Joseph's theology, too. What an encouraging message from Alistair Begg and Truth For Life. God has indeed directed each one of our steps from the beginning all the way to the end. Tomorrow, Alistair will conclude our study of the life of Joseph called The Hand of God. This wonderful picture of God's providence in Joseph's life reminds us that God is always in control. He's always with us. History is full of men and women of faith. Men and women who, like Joseph, trusted in God despite their circumstances and who accomplished amazing things for the kingdom. Many of these stories are contained in a devotional titled Her Story. This book compiles the accounts of 366 women of faith from the first century all the way down to our own day. Women like Charity Bancroft or Johnny Erickson Tata. We'd love to get you a copy of this devotional today so you can begin the new year being encouraged by these daily stories. The devotional comes with our thanks when you donate to support this ministry. At this time of year, your support is essential so that we can end 2018 fully funded. Will you join with us today? Give a generous year-end donation when you call 888-588-7884. Or if it's easier, you can give online at truthforlife.org. But either way, remember to ask for your copy of the devotional titled Her Story. And as you look ahead to next week and anticipate your family's Christmas celebration, I'd like to extend a special invitation to you. For the first time, the Christmas Eve service at Parkside Church will be streamed live on Monday evening at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Alistair will be leading the celebration of Christ's birth in a traditional service that dates back all the way to the late 1800s, a service that features scripture readings and carols. It's a wonderfully moving time that you won't want to miss. Join us online at truthforlife.org slash live or search Truth For Life on YouTube. Again, that's Christmas Eve, 8 p.m. Eastern Time. I'm Bob Lapine, hoping you'll join us again tomorrow when Alistair reflects on the life of Joseph and describes the key to remaining steadfast through the years. We're learning how to leave a godly legacy for the next generation as we conclude our series titled The Hand of God. This daily program features the Bible teaching of Alistair Begg, and it's furnished by Truth For Life. where the learning is for living.